Good evening, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the last EC Game Changer seminar of the year. Uh, I'm your host today. My name is Mark Sargent. I'm EC Science Program Manager, and it is my pleasure this evening or this morning, depending on where you are, to uh, introduce today's speaker, uh, Andrew Ponson. Andrew is a professor for cosmology at UCL, um, where he has been since 2013. He previously held postdoctoral fellowship positions also in the UK, in Oxford and uh, Cambridge, where he graduated with a PhD as well. So, uh, yeah, Andrew is a well known modeler and simulator theorist uh, looking into how galaxies evolve in a cosmological context. Uh, this is also the topic of today's talk. And we're really looking forward to this and what we, I think, can safely assume, given that Andrew is a member of the Royal Society's Public Engagement Committee, is that this will be a very entertaining talk. He has a long track record of speaking in front of very varied and distinguished audiences. So, Andrew, thanks again also from my side that you agreed to give today's talk. And uh, you can take it away whenever you're ready. We're really looking forward to your presentation today, which is entitled Genetically Modified Galaxies. So do tell us about galactic DNA, please. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction and for inviting me along. And, and thank you to, to everyone who's joining. Um, I will indeed try to make it as, as entertaining as I can. Um, so I, I, I'm just going to start by um, mentioning that, you know, the, the, the work that I'm going to show today is the result of huge collaboration, uh, extending even beyond the people that you see on the, the screen here. But uh, these are, are, are many of the key figures who've been involved. And I'm not going to have time to, of course, talk about all the science we've been doing. I'm going to sort of focus in on, on cherry pick a few things uh, to, 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 to try and uh, uh, show you uh, some of what GM galaxies or genetically modified galaxies uh, is, is all about. And uh, we're very lucky that we've received support from, from the Royal Society and the European Research Council for this uh, programme. So what, what am I actually going to talk about? Well, uh, in a nutshell, this is what I'm going to say, that if, if you're interested in doing simulations of, of anything, really, but specifically, of course, we're doing cosmological simulations, trying to understand the formation of structures and particularly galaxies, then there are really three ingredients that go into that. And, and, and one of the first things I want to talk about is where those three ingredients come from. So there's physics, the stuff that you would, of course, expect to go into a simulation, things like uh, laws of gravity, say, or hydrodynamics and so on, magnetic fields, what, what have you. Um, then there's initial conditions, which is something about well, what is the actual setup that we're interested in simulating. So in the case of cosmology, this is quite an interesting question. What does it mean to have initial conditions for the universe? Well, it turns out that we actually know quite a lot about the young universe through things like the Planck satellite uh, and before it, the WMAP and COBE satellites that measured the cosmic microwave background. I'll say a tiny bit about that. Um, but uh, we're, we're in the uh, game of understanding how uh, possible differences in the initial conditions. So differences and things that happened in the opening fraction of a second of the universe uh, trace through to the kind of structures that we see today. And uh, that's really at the heart of the genetically modified idea that um, in some sense, the early universe forms a kind of genome for the universe today, that it then gets very heavily processed here, the physics uh, changes what the universe is like very heavily, but in some sense, uh, that the, the particular galaxies and structures that we end up with are encoded for in those initial conditions. And we're, we're studying that encoding. Um, so physics, initial conditions, but also um, uh, uh, subgrid physics. So not just physics that we would recognize as well-established physics, like hydrodynamics and gravity, as I mentioned, or magnetic fields, anything like this, but also something called subgrid physics, which is where essentially we, we run out of the ability to model things from first principles. Uh, and, and this is absolutely vital to understand if you want to understand how to interpret simulations. So I'll say a little bit about that. 
Um, and so then I'll come on to, to trying to convince you that this idea of genetic modification, which is tinkering with the initial conditions, can tell us something about cause and effect in our universe. That's actually really important because, as I will show you through example, when we see correlations in the universe, we can't assume the uh, causal mechanisms behind those are straightforward, even if we can simulate those correlations. So sometimes we end up in a situation where we have a simulated population of galaxies, say, and they have uh, certain correlations within them. They might even mimic the correlations that we see in the real universe. But uh, the actual causal mechanisms for establishing those correlations are rather unclear. And, uh, and this is where the genetic modification idea can be at its strongest to, to kind of probe well, what's going on causally. Um, and and to, to, to show you this without it just seeming too general and, and, and too philosophical, I'm going to particularly home in on the example of galaxy quenching, the way that galaxies stop forming stars and change their morphology, which is uh, still a kind of major uh, open question, even though we have a fair understanding of some some of the mechanisms behind that but i'll talk a bit about what we do know about that and and how the genetic modification idea is, is adding to that knowledge so uh that's really an, an outline of, of what i'm going to cover and i'll cover it in three sections i'll i'll talk a little bit bit about simulations in general to start with um and then i'll come on and set up this problem of galactic morphology and the relationship to the way that galaxies form new stars and finally, I'll, I'll talk about what, what it is we're actually doing in uh, the uh, GM Galaxies program. Now, I couldn't resist adding a little plug uh, because uh, this first section is informed by research I did for a, a book that, that has just come out. This is actually a popular level book, um, so it, you know, it doesn't, doesn't get to delve into details. But um, it uh, was a lot of fun to research because I learned a lot about connections between the way different simulations work in, in different fields, far beyond cosmology, and uh, the, the sort of history of how we came to this position of, of taking almost for granted the idea that we can simulate the universe, the idea of fitting the universe in a box is, is the, the more you think about it, the sort of stranger and more ambitious it seems, the idea that we might actually be able to simulate anything in space, let alone the universe as a whole. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to start with that. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you what some of our own simulations look like and just talk you through what's going on in them before kind of backtracking and explaining how, how it all works. So, what, what I'm going to show you here is a, a simulation of the formation of something very much like our own Milky Way. And it starts from the very early universe. We don't go all the way back to the Big Bang itself, because, of course, uh, nobody knows exactly what the Big Bang consisted of. So this is what I was talking about earlier on. We have to make some assumptions about the initial conditions, the conditions in the universe, in our case, actually a few uh, million years, normally after after the Big Bang itself. Um, it turns out that we know quite a lot about that time, as I said, through uh, observational constraints from things like the, the Planck satellite and so on that measure the cosmic microwave background, but also from theory. The, the theory of quantum mechanics in the early universe, and in particular, an idea known as inflation that I don't really have time to go into today, gives us uh, a firm footing to understand what we see in those cosmic microwave background observations and connect them to initial conditions that we can then put into simulations as a starting point. And then as the universe goes through time, you can see I've, I've cut out a sort of little section of the universe here. You can see it expanding. Of course, the expansion of the universe is, is included. Uh, and you can also see as time goes on that it starts out initially looking quite uniform. But as time goes on, as well as the expansion, you're also seeing structures start to form. It's no longer so uniform. And what's going on is that um, very small changes from one place to another. So what were initially changes in our simulation of one part in about 10 to the five quickly get amplified through gravity. So if you have one region of the simulation that has slightly more material in it than some other region, then there's a net pull of gravity into that region and that quickly accumulate, accumulates material uh, within that region that just started out very slightly uh, more dense than its neighbors. It quickly becomes 
much more dense than its neighbors. And this is a sort of runaway process where the, uh, the, the force of gravity gets stronger and stronger uh, as this process goes on. And I'm spinning the universe around here just so you can see the 3D structure. Of course, we don't think that the, the real universe spins. That's a whole other interesting question, but we don't, we don't think it does. This is just spinning it around so you see the 3D structure. And the other thing to say about this is I've paused it about 1.7 billion years into the formation of the Milky Way, but so far you can't see anything that you would be able to see with a real telescope, because actually the view I'm showing you here is of dark matter in the simulation. So again, I don't have a lot of time today to go into uh, all the evidence and so on, but uh, it's a uh, al almost uh, universally accepted consensus that our universe uh, is uh, dominated in terms of its gravitational uh, mass by dark matter. Um, and there are all sorts of reasons to, to believe that, uh, not least of which is that it actually uh, is able to undergo this kind of runaway process of forming uh, structure in the early universe that simply wouldn't be possible if you didn't have the kind of gravitation, extra gravitational pull from dark matter. So with that very, very brief, uh, I realize all too brief explanation, I'm going to move on and just just say that you know the dark matter is generating um, a gravitational potential into which other material can form. Uh, in, in, other other material can fall. So, well, if if I switch views and take a look at the gas and stars in this universe, again this is just spinning the universe around so you can see the three D structure. Then where there were accumulations of dark matter, there's a, a sort of net gravitational pull in towards those areas. And now you are now you can see what happens in those areas. You uh, start accumulating gas, and the, the bright dots that you can see on the screen right now, that's where stars have actually started to form in the nascent universe. So we can go, go for a fly through our universe. This is you know going, going over millions of light years, so uh, not, not something that's ever going to be possible to do in reality. But uh, uh, we can fly through and you see the, uh, the, the little lumps. These are essentially the, the, the building blocks of galaxies. And when you switch back on the dark matter, you can see it's sort of forming a scaffolding for, uh, for, for these um, little, little proto galaxies. Um, and now if I start evolving through time again, but now zoomed in to one of those little proto galaxies, what you'll see is that uh, galaxies build over time by merging lots of smaller galaxies together. So over time, they get larger and larger through a sort of series of mergers. We call this hierarchical structure formation. And it's all being driven by the dark matter. If we didn't have the dark matter, this hierarchical structure formation wouldn't be uh, going at all like this um, and, and, and building these larger and larger galaxies. So if I skip all the way forward to 13.567 billion years uh, to the present day, uh, then all of these things merge together and um, ultimately form something like our Milky Way. And we can do tricks like, you know, fly, fly in, fly our camera in and take a look at what the night sky is supposed to look like from roughly the position of the sun. Of course, we, we don't resolve anything that we could point at and say it's the sun, uh, let alone any planets. But uh, you can you can put the camera roughly where you think the sun should be, and you end up with a night sky that looks roughly like the real thing. And um, you know th this, on some level, is quite a convincing story. We do have lots of supporting evidence to say that the story that I'm telling you right now is not just made up, uh, but but actually corresponds to a lot of real observations. Uh, ranging all the way from that cosmic microwave background that tells us about the early universe through uh, telescopes that can uh, peer back and you know look back times that take you all the way back to well what, what is it sort of redshifts of 10 now um, and uh, all the way down to uh, local scales where we look at the universe around us at some level this picture holds water but I'm giving you the sort of varnished version of it. You know, there are there are a lot of unanswered questions about this. And so now if I take a step back and start telling you what's actually in these simulations that uh, gives rise to this picture, then it starts to become clearer why there are so many unanswered questions. So 
you know, you can you can trace the idea of simulations a very long way back. Um, in, you can trace it all the way back to antiquity if you want to, but certainly you can find first sort of mentions of it in the modern sense in the work of Ada Lovelace in the 19th century. Um, and perhaps the first claim to performing anything like a modern simulation is actually in the realm of weather forecasting. So this is Lewis Fry Richardson, who made an attempt at forecasting the weather essentially by solving the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, so, you know, the, the, the laws of fluid dynamics, um, doing it entirely by hand. So he had, uh, he, he, he built a grid of some initial conditions for a weather forecast and tried to produce a weather forecast that would uh, span over a few hours. Um, it took him months of calculating to be able to do this. So it wasn't in any sense a practical thing. It was just supposed to, demonstrate that, uh, that that this was possible in principle. And you can see the uh, the, the, the forms that he, he made himself. He made himself a sort of series of forms that he would fill in that had discretized versions of the Navier-Stokes equations on them and then tried to solve those. Um, and, um, you know, was basically doing something very, very similar to a modern hydrodynamical simulation, uh, either of a cosmological sort or of a weather forecasting sort or of, of, of any other hydrodynamical simulation you care to mention and obtained a lot of insights that we now lean on about how to do those hydrodynamical simulations well. But he was doing it all by hand. Uh, and more than that, he was doing it actually on the front line of World War One. So he had his work cut out for him. Um, and uh, it wasn't a great success, but I mean, he was encouraged enough by it to write a whole book about this and um, even envisaged, you know, how this would work practically. So he had the idea that you could perform these simulations by getting enough people together in a purpose-built amphitheater. So this is a this is a sort of imagining of what that amphitheater would look like um, by an artist in, in 1986, but this was actually put forward in a book by Richardson in 1922. So the idea was you would divide the surface of the earth into a, a bunch of grid squares, and you would have mathematicians behind each grid square. So if you look closely at this, you can actually see behind each uh, grid square, there is a sort of team working on doing the calculations. Um, and then they're sort of all coordinated by, by people in the center. So uh, this was Lewis Fry Richardson's idea about how a simulation should work. Now, of course, they don't work quite like that. They, they work with uh, digital computers, obviously, um, but actually many of the principles that he wrote about there, um, about how uh, you can uh, discretize the partial differential equations and solve them numerically, are, are still leaned on today. Um, so, you know, the first example of something like uh, a hydrodynamical simulation of this sort was actually uh, performed on the ENIAC computer by Jewel Charney, meteorologist and, and a large team in the 1950s. And again, you know, this, this lays a lot of the foundations for the way we think about hydrodynamical simulations today. So, you know, the, the there's a definitely you know, a strong connection between the way that this was pushed forward for weather forecasting and, and what we're doing in, uh, in uh, simulations uh, today in cosmology. And one of the uh, things that came a little later, I mean, actually, it was in Richardson's work as well, but it really came to the fore in the 1970s with early work on climate change, was the importance of the subgrid, which I mentioned a little bit earlier on. So if you look at this, diagram from Sakura Manabe's work in uh, 1975, where he was trying to forecast you know, the, the climate for decades ahead, then you can basically split, and he's got this sort of block diagram of how his simulation works, you can split it into two parts. There's physics that we recognize as physics, the thermodynamics, the equations of motion, the radiation transfer, and so on. But there's also the bit at the bottom right, uh, which is things like, well, how, how do precipitation and evaporation work? How does the heat balance of the Earth's surface work? How does, how, do, how does water seep away on the Earth's surface? And this is something that you can't really calculate from first principles. Um, and so he was forced to put in a collection of rules that, you, that, that basically correct for the fact that if you didn't put these in by hand, then the computer wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to correctly include them because it's happening on far too small scales 
to be included while you're also trying to uh, resolve what's going on across the whole planet. So this is what it looks like, you know, this is what a, a plan for a simulation of climate or weather looks like. You need some initial conditions, present day observations perhaps, or the, the, and, and the atmospheric composition. You need physics, which will consist of radiative transfer, hydrodynamics and so on. Uh, and you also have to have subgrid, otherwise your, your um, uh, simulation is just going to turn out to be garbage. And now something similar is true in cosmology, and it's what makes a lot of what we do very hard, that uh, we need like all three of these things if we want to be able to say anything meaningful. So, you know, the, the path to simulations in cosmology is uh, also quite uh, winding and brings in these ideas at different times, but I just wanted to highlight two early steps, which I think are particularly interesting. The first being uh, Eric Homburg in the 1940s, doing a simulation of two galaxies colliding, where he didn't have a digital computer, of course, um, but he also didn't want to do everything by hand, uh, because his problem in, in terms of the number of calculations is even harder than Richardson's weather forecast. So he actually did it by using light bulbs in a laboratory and using the one over R squared decay of the light as a proxy for one over R squared uh, gravitational force law. So he was able to measure the intensity of light, use that of, as a proxy for gravitational force. And so create a simulation of two colliding galaxies. You see the initial conditions in the top panel there. And in the bottom panel, you see these two galaxies have collided and flung out spiral arms. So this is the first kind of galaxy simulation that, uh, that uh, I was able to locate in the literature. And uh, another uh, foundational work that deserves uh, mention is that of Beatrice Tinsley in the 90, late 1960s and onwards into the 1970s, where she um, did things rather differently. I mean, she really focused, if you like, on, on the subgrid, on the idea that if you really want to understand what's going on in a galaxy, then you have to understand things like the way stars are forming and the regulation of you know, when stars form, why they form and how they change the galaxy when they form. So uh, she can lay claim to running the, the, the first uh, simulation of this type. We sometimes call these um, semi-analytic models today, but in, in a sense, you know, the, the boundary between what we would call a simulation and what we call a semi-analytic model is a little arbitrary. Um, so, uh, you know, the simulations bring in a lot of the same ideas. And, um, you know, it, I, I think it's it's an example also of uh, the, the work uh, of simulators really feeding into observational cosmology very, very early on. So what Beatrice Tinsley was able to show was that uh, essentially the, 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 there was no way of reconciling the observed galaxy population with an idea that was prevalent at the time, which was that galaxies are essentially fairly static objects. They're not changing very much over time. She showed that wasn't tenable by essentially showing that it just wasn't possible to uh, understand galaxies in, in that way using pretty rudimentary simulations, but, but coming to a pretty watertight conclusion. Um, and this actually, you know, overturned the consensus in cosmology of the day. The consensus was that the universe was on its way to recollapsing. But it turned out that was based on assuming that when you look back through time to distant galaxies, that they're all shining with the same brightness. Uh, Beatrice Tinsley showed that wasn't possible. And, uh, and in that way, um, it just upended that consensus. And of course, today we know that, it's, that the universe isn't recollapsing, it's actually accelerating. It's, it's expanding at an accelerating rate. Um, this is a, another effect that I don't have time to talk about very much today called dark energy. Uh, it's a sort of counterpart to dark matter, but it seems to be pushing the universe apart on very large scales rather than uh, dark matter, which is gathering the, the, the materials for the galaxies on, on the small scales. So there were these foundational works going on very early on uh, in, uh, in, in uh, the cosmology community. Um, but I mean, if, if, if I then trace it all the way through to the present day, um, I don't have time to go through the whole history. So let's just have a look at how what we're doing compares to what I was showing you a moment for weather forecasting. Well, what do the initial conditions look like? Well, you know, we we have these ideas around what was going on in the very early universe. They're based on quantum mechanical calculations and this idea called inflation. 
We have a strong ideas about uh, the cosmic composition that's based on dark matter and dark energy. And there's kind of interesting interplay there that actually, you know, some of the evidence for dark matter and dark energy is fairly directly derived from observations. But actually, a lot of it is derived from trying to do simulations without dark matter and dark energy and finding that you just can't reproduce the universe as it is today. So, I mean, for, for example, in the work of people uh, in the 1980s, Carlos Frank and uh, George F. Stathew and these people, first of all, showed that you really need dark matter to form anything like the, uh, the, the cosmic web of galaxies that we see today. And then went on to actually predict that you also needed dark energy in order to get the scale of the, the cosmic web correct. And that was later confirmed by um, observations of, of supernovae using the Hubble Space Telescope. So the, the, there's been an interplay there. But, you know, right now, uh, initial conditions will nearly always consist of a universe with dark matter and dark energy in it, in addition to the familiar um, standard model particles that, that we know and love. Um, and uh, yes, you couple that to these specific initial conditions that, that come from inflation that I'm going to be talking more about in a moment. Physics, more or less anything you think of could be relevant to this. The, the, the single most important piece of physics is certainly gravitation. Um, but then on top of that, you need to understand uh, the behavior of gas. Uh, of radiation, and uh, arguably you also need to understand uh, what the magnetic fields are up to in cosmology in order to, to run a meaningful simulation. And then, you know, the real the real Achilles heel of the whole program, in some sense, is, is the need for a subgrid, that we can't simultaneously track even a sort of reasonable chunk of the universe, even just, you know, for one galaxy, let alone the hundreds of billions that we know are out there, uh, you can't simultaneously track that whole galaxy and see from first principles stars forming. So we have to lean on this idea of a subgrid that, you know, but be below what the simulation can uh, resolve in, in terms of real physics, we have to make assumptions about the way that stars form, for example, but also about the way that black holes form and the way that dust forms and the way that cosmic rays form and so on. Um, and many of the ideas here, you can actually, you know, draw, draw a direct line all the way back to that, that work that I was mentioning a moment ago of, of Beatrice Tinsley. And it's developed over many decades um, and, of course, now looks a, a lot more complicated. But it's basically the same idea that you, you just have to step in and uh, make some reasonable assumptions and then see what you can conclude as a result. So when I showed you the simulations uh, a moment ago, where I showed you that overall picture of the way the universe, uh, the galaxies in the universe are built, uh, many of these things are in there. And in particular, those assumptions about the way that stars form and the way that black holes form are in there. And we have to calibrate uh, those assumptions to a large degree. It's not really possible to say from first principles how quickly stars should form in any given patch of gas. We have to calibrate based on uh, empirically observed star formation rates. Um, for, for, for the experts in the audience, this is things like the schmidt kennicutt relation. Uh, we calibrate on things like that to try and get reasonable star formation rates in the simulations. And so then, you know, you, you, you might justifiably say at that point, well, you know, what's, what's the point of the enterprise then? If you, you, you know, you can't predict from first principles what the universe is supposed to be like. Uh, but rather you have to put things in by hand and then even tune them in order to get anything like the real universe. And I think the answer that most simulators give would be that uh, despite the fact that we have to tune certain things, there are, there are other aspects uh, that are quite predictive. So, um, for example, we, uh, we, we know that the whole picture of dark matter and dark energy arose from being able to make predictions for the cosmic web uh, in the sort of 1980s simulations and so on. Um, and there have also been many examples since then of predictions that have been made about the way that galaxies assemble. So a good example would be, for example, that, you know, galaxies assemble hierarchically, as, as I was showing you earlier on. So if you go back to uh, earlier times in our universe, redshift two or three, then you should find that on average galaxies are dimmer, they're split into to smaller fragments. And to a large extent, that was borne out uh, by observations with things like the Hubble Space Telescope. 
Uh, so, you know, the picture that comes together is subtle and, and, and its relation to the empirical calibration is subtle, but it, it is able to make uh, predictions to a certain degree. Now, right now, of course, everybody's talking about results from the James Webb Space Telescope. So here's a, here's a nice uh, picture from Good South. This is from the JADES team taken with James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful picture to look at. And you'll probably have seen um, some discussion either in the literature or if you're not following this area in the literature, then in the press about, oh my goodness, have we got cosmology all wrong? Because actually, when you look at a field like this, you find more bright galaxies at high redshift. So in the, in the ancient universe, we're actually finding more bright, bright galaxies uh, than we were expecting to find. But I take a pretty circumspect view on this right at the moment, because the fact is that the, 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 this is looking back to, you know, redshifts approaching 10. And at redshifts approaching 10, the universe was a very different place. And bearing in mind that we have these subgrid models in the background that are, are, are cru crucial to making these predictions. Unfortunately, the slightest error in your assumption about the way that stars form at those very early times will just translate into making incorrect predictions for the brightnesses of, of galaxies at, at early times. And so, you know, the, the overall web of evidence that we have supporting the sort of overall picture that's coming from the simulations is very strong. And so right at this moment, I would say, despite the exciting results from James Webb, the, the overall picture doesn't look terribly threatened by that. And it's probably more telling us about um, details of what was going on in the early universe that are going to be very exciting to understand, but then they're not really going to be disrupting the whole consensus around cosmology in, in the way that some uh, authors have, have claimed. So, I think, you know, another another thing to really be looking out for is the gravitational wave area. So I'm personally tremendously excited by, uh, oops, by, by Lisa, which is coming online in what, you know, uh, 15 years or something, maybe. I mean, and so it's, uh, it's uh, some, some way off still. But um, before Lisa, even, we're starting to see results from pulsar timing arrays, which are giving us some hint about, about gravitational waves on very large scales. And what facilities like this are able to tell us is not just about the visible universe, but also about what the buildup of the black hole population in, in the high redshift universe is doing. And simulations are able to make predictions for this as well. And if you tie all of this together, uh, then, um, you know, if you, if you fast forward 15, 20 years, then we should have a picture where we really understand that buildup of the galaxy population in the early universe very well through a combination of um, uh, um, you know, in, uh, electromagnetic observations and, and gravitational wave observations. So you know, we're at a really exciting time for simulations that I think we can step up our game a bit and uh, try and really understand in more detail how we should think about these very small scale processes. But um, it's, also, it's also very challenging for reasons that I've partly outlined and I'm partly gonna come to. I'm, I'm now going to move on to talking about sort of specific question in galaxy formation at the moment. And that is the question of galactic morphology. So why is it that some galaxies look very different from others? Uh, and that goes hand in hand with uh, the question of, you know, at what rate do, do stars form in galaxies? What's really dictating that rate and, and how does that relate to morphology? Um, what we've known about this for 90 years or more is that there is a huge diversity of morphologies in the galaxies that we see. Uh, so this is the famous Hubble tuning fork diagram um, showing uh, on, on the left hand side the sort of red elliptical type galaxies and on the right hand side the bluer spiral type galaxies which are further subdivided into spirals and barred spirals and it's really quite a fundamental question about you know why why is it that there is this diversity and this range of different galaxy morphologies and why is it that the colors also uh, correlate so strongly with the morphology why is it that typically speaking uh, a disk galaxy will be blue, which indicates that it's actively forming young stars, whereas uh, an elliptical galaxy will uh, be uh, redder, 
which suggests um, that it hasn't had much re recent star formation. So what is it that ties all of these things together? Now, simulations certainly uh, have plenty to say in this area. And one of the earliest uh, bits of work on this uh, that I remember is from uh, Tiziana Di Matteo, uh, who showed these really stunning results in 2005, where for the first time, um, she and uh, Walker Springle and Lars Hernquist had coded in uh, some subgrid physics to represent the formation of uh, supermassive black holes. So the idea was if you have supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies, then uh, when these things start to accrete material, when material falls into those supermassive black holes, it gets extremely hot and dense. And we know from observations that that uh, generates a lot of energy as material falls into supermassive black holes. And in particular, the, uh, the picture that they put forward from these simulations in 2005 was that if uh, two galaxies merge, then that can drive gas into their black holes and that can generate a lot of energy and the energy in turn can drive away the remaining gas. And so then uh, the, the, the gas is lost from the disk of the galaxy. And so you, don't, you, you just don't have the fuel supply to form any more stars. And because you've got a merger going on, you also sort of scramble all the orbits of the stars so even if they started out as disks, you end up with a with a messy elliptical. And you know, at some level, this picture um, has uh, uh, stuck in 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 the community mind. It's uh, definitely still a sort of basis for how we think about this. But uh, the, the the picture has become much more subtle in the intervening two decades or so. I mean, we certainly know outflows uh, do exist in the universe. We've got plenty of evidence for that. Uh, this is an example, I think this is M82, where you see uh, outflowing gas being sort of expelled from this, from this disk galaxy. Um, but perhaps, you know, to, to, to summarize what this looks like, uh, the best plot I could find is from SDSS's Manga survey. So what you're seeing here is a, a plot of, on the x-axis, the stellar mass of a galaxy has inferred from observations and on the y-axis the um, uh, current star formation rate so the rate at which it's forming new stars so you can see first of all loosely that there's this thing called the main sequence that's what this uh, dashed black line is all about loosely saying well if you've got more stars to start with then you're going to be forming stars at a higher rate so these contours in the background show a very large population of STSS galaxies, uh, the density of those galaxies. And you can see that there's a very clear correlation between their current stellar mass and, and their rate of forming new stars. But uh, MANGA, which is an integral field unit uh, extension to STSS, is able to take spectra of lots of different uh, pixels within a galaxy and so start to resolve in across the sort of whole population of galaxies, what's going on spectroscopically. And using that spectroscopic information, you're able to uh, infer the rate at which gas is outflowing from these galaxies. So these, these colored points are all individual manga galaxies plotted in the correct place for their, for their current stellar mass and star formation rate, but colored by their outflow rate. And um, what you'll see from this is, first of all, it, it highlights the fact that not all galaxies sit on the main sequence. That's uh, so there, there are galaxies down here which have much lower star formation rates than you would expect from the main sequence. And that's that's actually exactly what we knew because this, this corresponds to those red ellipticals that I was talking about earlier on, massive galaxies that for some reason seem to have stopped forming stars or are forming stars at a much reduced rate compared to their main sequence counterparts. But what you'll immediately notice about this is if you, if you compare to the, to the outflow rates, well, the outflow rates are actually highest. So these blue colors are highest outflow rates. They are highest in the galaxies that are forming stars at the largest rate. So it's not like, oh, these, these galaxies that have stopped forming stars have, have huge outflows that we can detect. In fact, they have relatively low rates of outflow. It's the, it's the galaxies that are forming stars quickly that have the high outflow rates. Now, if you stop and think about this for a minute, it's probably not that surprising because if you don't 
you know, if the idea is where well, you don't have much gas if you're down here, uh, so, you know, you're not forming stars because you don't have very much gas. Um, if that's the idea, then um, it, it, there's not much gas left to expel. So presumably we're seeing these things later after they've expelled their gas. But it just highlights that it's very hard observationally to make these kind of connections that in simulations might seem to be possible. Um, so, you know, a, a similar so the similar message is if you take that same plane of current stellar mass versus star formation rate and you plot on uh, the abundance of neutral hydrogen within that galaxy. So this is from the, the, the X cold gas survey. And you can see that, oh, yeah, I mean, the things that are forming stars at a high rate do, on average, have higher amounts of hydrogen available to them than the things down here. It doesn't really tell you very directly about cause and effect. It's, it's, it's unclear. Like, is, it, 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 have these things got low star formation rates because they have little gas in them, or is there something more complicated going on? Other correlations that uh, potentially have a bearing on this include the relationship between the amount of light coming from a galaxy's bulge, and the, uh, that's on the, the x-axis here, and the estimated mass of its black hole on the on the y-axis is a very tight correlation between these, which uh, has a lot to say about what's going on inside galaxies. Um, and in particular, I think uh, one really interesting result is that if you divide galaxies into ones which have um, uh, uh, high star formation rates, uh, and uh, and ones that have low star formation rates. So the ones with high star formation rates are now colored in blue, and the ones with low star formation rates are colored in red. Then you can see that on top of that sort of overall relation between the stellar mass and the black hole mass, you also have a segregation where things that have a higher black hole mass are also preferentially likely to have stopped forming their stopped forming new stars or reduce their rate of forming new stars. So uh, the, the, there's some very interesting correlations there, um, but it's difficult to pull out exactly what's going on as a kind of uh, causal story. So then you can turn to big simulations and say, well, okay, so what, what do simulations have to say about this? It's all very well merging two galaxies in a very idealized setup uh, as that work from Tiziana Di Matteo did, but that's really can't tell you about the population as a whole. That can just tell you about some very idealized setup. The initial conditions for that are totally contrived. We want to know what happens in, in something that looks much more like the real universe with all those fluctuations and complications that I was talking about earlier on. So there are simulations out there that reproduce something like the uh, Hubble uh, tuning fork of diversity of morphology. I'm showing you the Eagle simulations here just because uh, those are ones I'm going to focus on uh, when I talk about the genetic modifications, which is coming in just a second. Um, but we've actually worked with in the in the GM Galaxies team. We've actually worked with many different simulation codes so that we get a kind of flavor of how our results are affected by different subgrid assumptions and, and so on. So within these simulations, before you do any of this genetic modification idea, what, what can you say about, uh, uh, you know, what's giving rise to one of these things. So say, you know, why, why is it, for example, that there is that scatter in the black hole masses if you look at fixed mass? If you look at fixed mass of galaxy, why do you see a scatter in black hole masses? You do see it in the simulation, just as you do in the real universe, but why is it there? Um, and um, in 2019, John Davies, who would later come and work with me as a, as a postdoc, put out a paper saying, well, it seems to be something to do with uh, the, uh, the, the this quantity here, which without going into detail, it's essentially a proxy for when the galaxy first formed. So galaxies that form early uh, seem to have a high black hole mass, and galaxies that form late in the history of the universe seem to have a low black hole mass. So um, th th there's a there's a question that, that he raised: is you know is that what's going on? Is it that it's to do with when you form a galaxy decides what morphology it's going to end up with. And of course that would then have knock on implications for what you would expect to see in these high redshift observations and, and so on. Well, that's a hypothesis, but you can't tell from this correlation, strong though it is, whether that's really what's uh, going on or not. 
Um, so that brings me to the genetically modified simulations. I'm aware I've taken a while to get there, um, but I'm going to tell you very briefly uh, what we can add to this picture. So the point is that the early universe consists of these fluctuations that I was talking about earlier on that emerge from uh, uh, quantum mechanics in, in the early universe, or at least that's our best understanding of what they emerge from. And because they all emerge from quantum mechanics, they're essentially random. They, they, they have certain statistical properties, but you can't predict them completely a priori. And that gives you some license as a simulator. You don't just have to accept, if I've simulated a particular region of the universe, I don't just have to accept that at face value. I can ask kind of what if questions. So what if my universe had started out with a slightly different set of fluctuations in the early universe? This can that you can craft slight changes to that in such a way that you stay consistent with the um, uh, statistical properties of the the random field. So you're not doing anything that's statistically forbidden by the quantum mechanics, uh, but that you also accomplish something that you want to accomplish. So you might, for example, change the um, uh, particular density of some region of the universe, and that will change when it when a galaxy forms in that region or whether it uh, you know forms out of lots of individual uh, small galaxies that come together or whether it forms in a slightly smoother way you can change all of these things by going in and carefully changing the initial conditions for the simulation that's what we do now if you if you take a look at an example this is from the very first paper on this by nina roth who was a postdoc with me at the time um Here's the region, so you can ignore the fuzzy region. This is the region of the early universe that we're going to change. And the kind of changes we're talking about, if I flip backwards and forwards, you can see they're really tiny. You just can make very tiny changes, but that makes quite a big knock-on difference to the way that a galaxy will form and evolve in that region. And so, um, you know, here's an example of three simulations side by side, which have, uh, uh, initial conditions which are genetically modified variants of each other where we've gone in and made these changes and uh, essentially what we were doing in this early work is just changing the way that mergers happen so thinking about uh, you know what what this does to black holes and what it does to uh, galaxy star formation rate in particular and so you know you can see here that we have a enhanced merger on the right where this thing is bigger, it falls in earlier, it's about to merge into the central galaxy there. Uh, on the left, we've suppressed its mass. That means because it's lighter, it actually falls in slightly later, um, but it carries in a lot less mass with it. And then, you know, we've had to simulate this thing three times with the three different initial conditions, and we, we see what we get. Um, and what you end up with is the following. So if you plot the star formation rate so this is, again, the, the specific star formation rate. So it's the rate at which it's forming new stars relative to its current star, the, the current mass in stars. If you plot it for the original uh, galaxy, which had a kind of sort of medium merger, then you find it sort of, its star formation rate dips off slightly, but then recovers. In the enhanced case, you find that the merger has a much greater effect, and then the uh, star formation rate stays low, even uh, sort so of permanently, permanently quenches the star formation in, in this galaxy. And in the case that we actually suppressed the merger ratio, actually, it, it turns out to have a slightly enhanced star formation rate because of that, uh, because it is sort of delivering new gas without disrupting anything too much. So we're able to sort of construct and test particular scenarios, all while keeping the overall cosmological environment consistent with uh, what we, we, we know to be uh, uh, cosmologically realistic. Um, we're sort of skip, skipping ahead slightly because I'm, uh, I'm aware of the time. So, so let me come back to this central question of how does this actually help us understand populations? So remember, Eagle is this simulation which has a large population of galaxies. It clearly has um, uh, trends in it, but trying to interpret what those trends mean is, is hard. But what you can do if you, if you have the ability to just take an individual galaxy out of that simulation, 
make some change to its history by changing the initial conditions and then re-simulate it, you can ask causally. You can you can turn this question sort of speculation of, okay, is this is this change in the black hole mass related to it collapsing early, as indicated by this correlation? And, and are these ones with a low black hole mass getting a low black hole mass because they collapse late? You can actually test that. So what John did when he uh, came to do a postdoc with me is he constructed, took out a galaxy, a particularly interesting galaxy, and constructed different histories just for that one galaxy. So here you're seeing the mass of that galaxy as a function of time in, in his simulations. They all converge to about the same mass by uh, redshift zero by, by the present day, but they have different histories. So he very directly took the original galaxy and uh, made it collapse earlier. So the original galaxy is this sort of uh, turquoise line here. And uh, he made it collapse earlier. That's this blue, dark blue line here that he's labeled early secular. So this is a galaxy that assembles fairly smoothly. It doesn't have too many of these major mergers along the way. Um, and now he's just made it assemble earlier to test. Would, will that make it end up with a, a higher mass black hole or not? But he's also constructed other histories where he gives it a major merger. So he keeps everything else the same, but he inserts a major merger into its history. So that's the orange line. And also he can insert the major merger and change the time at which the galaxy assembled. And that gives you the purple line here. Um, and what you find is if you look at the black hole mass as a function of time, it does not respond to the thing that John expected it to. So um, he, he was expecting based on his previous work that the black hole mass would essentially respond to how, how early the galaxy started to form. So the early formers, that would be the, the, the purple and the blue line ought to have got the largest black hole mass and the late formers, the orange and the turquoise line sh should have got the low black hole mass. But actually you find that it's the, uh, the, the, the pink and the orange line that end up high. Now those are not, that's not being distinguished by whether it collapses early, it's being distinguished by whether it has a merger or not. So while populations as a whole seem to indicate that uh, something to do with when galaxies form dictates their black hole mass and then as a knock-on effect dictates things to do with their current star formation rates, actually when you go and test this causally, it's a different story. And the reason it appears to be to do with whether you form galaxies early or not in a population is because statistically, if you form a galaxy early, you're also more likely to have major mergers. So you have to kind of tease that apart and, and this genetic modification approach gives you a way to do it. Just to say that this black hole mass then goes on and has the expected effect on the star formation rates. So when you're able to grow one of these big black holes, the star formation rate drops. Um, and what's really nice about this is that you can actually find out why. So you can go and look at these galaxies side by side. Other than the changes we've made, they're, based, they, they're identical galaxies, they've got identical environments, and you can see what's different. And the biggest single thing that's different is the circumgalactic gas. So where you have um, uh, uh, few mergers, you end up with circumgalactic gas that's quite uh, uh, dense and that is able to cool quite efficiently onto the central galaxy. Um, but when you enhance that, enhance those mergers, then you get a very different picture of the gas. The circumgalactic gas, it's slightly higher temperature, but most importantly, actually, it gets to lower densities. So the, the effect of being able to grow the black hole more is to uh, expel material, but the, 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 main, the main reason that that has an overall effect on the galaxy as a whole is because you end up um, expelling material so that the density of the gas surrounding the galaxy is lower. And that means that the cooling rates become much lower. All of this gas up here in the circumgalactic medium is not gonna cool for a hundred giga years. So it's just kept, you know, it's just not going to come into the galaxy. And you can then see it. Well, the reason that a galaxy ends up not having gas and not forming stars is to do with what the black hole has done to its surroundings. It's, it's 
by making the surroundings less dense, it's just prevented gas out there from cooling and fueling the, the central galaxy. So um, I really should wrap up. So I'll just mention very briefly that there are now observations of the circumgalactic medium, both with uh, HST uh, and, and also in, uh, in X-rays that uh, kind of back up this, this picture that are, are showing uh, that indeed the circumgalactic medium and the way the black hole impacts on the circumgalactic medium is really the way to think about what's going on here causally. So I have uh, overrun the time I think I should have spent. So I'm gonna leave these conclusions on the screen and then I think we're throwing it open to questions. That's right. Thank you very much, Andrew, for a more than 100 year long perspective on what we can do now and how that is based in what early pioneers did. It was really fun to see some of these early works. Um, and of course, yeah, your latest efforts to dissect this in, in all this detail. So yes, um, some of you have already added uh, questions to the chat. You can keep on doing so. We have roughly another 10 minutes before Andrew has to run. Uh, otherwise, you can also raise your hand and, and we will unmute you. But let's jump right in with a couple of questions from the, the chat. Uh, I'll take these in more or less chronological order in which they were posed. So uh, Nuno Pereira asks, uh, referring to yeah, the, the, the start of that early movie you showed, uh, the evolution of structure in the early universe, when dark matter needs to be added in these simulations. So uh, is this right away from the initial conditions? Is it after the Big Bang? Maybe, Andrew, you can explain a bit uh, the, when quantities, how the recipe is set up for the... Simulation. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. So, so sorry, I had to skate over that quite quickly. But yes, the dark matter is is in the simulation right from the outset. And in fact, you know, we have brilliant evidence that dark matter was in our universe at very, very early times. And that comes through uh, observations from things like Planck, you know, the cosmic microwave background. Because although you can't see the dark matter directly, you can see its gravitational effects, even in that leftover radiation. So, you know, right back few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, we can see the, the imprint of, of dark matter. It's very, very characteristic because back then, because the universe was so hot, anything made out of regular materials uh, really felt pressure. It felt the pressure in the early universe, whereas uh, dark matter by assumption doesn't feel that pressure. And so it's, it's able to create gravitational uh, indents in the early universe. Um, in a way that it wouldn't be able to if, if it felt if it felt that pressure. So, yes, it's there from the beginning, and and actually, there's great observational evidence that it has to be there from the beginning. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'll join two questions into one. Uh, the two questions are from Himanish Ganju and William Wall, and I think they both address the same general topic. And so, yeah. Why call these genetic modifications? And maybe you can just explain it a bit more, maybe the, the range of modifications you've looked at. You gave one specific example. Maybe you've tried other things. So give us a bit of a, a sense of what all you can tune and what the insights you gain are, in the, yes. depending on what you do. <laughs> yes. So, so we call it genetic modifications because the idea is that somehow, you know, the, the, the future of a whole galaxy is, is already written there in the initial conditions. You know, we, we're dealing, it's like the models are causal. So, so there's, nothing that, there's nothing in the uh, end result that in principle isn't already coded for in the initial conditions. In some sense, you know, the, the physics and indeed the subgrid physics that gets coded into the simulations is uh is like sort of nurturing uh the, the 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 initial sort of genome which dictates what kind of galaxy ought to be formed in that particular location so that's the metaphor i'm sorry if it's a little tortured um it, what we're what we're able to do is quite extensive now so i was uh, really focused in on making changes to when things build and you know whether they build out of just a few uh, lumps or maybe, you know, from some major major mergers or from sort of smoother, gradual accumulation of material. 
um, but we're we're able to do a lot and it, it's not just a case of reaching in and just by hand changing the density of the early universe you're not allowed to do that if you did that you would end up with something that's inconsistent with the uh, statistical nature of what comes out of inflation uh, out of this quantum mechanical calculations so it's uh, a bit more subtle than that and uh, i think maybe we shouldn't go into the, the technical details here but there's there's a paper by martin ray in, in 2018 who was my phd student at the time which which goes into the, the technical details but essentially you're trying to say i want to make a, a given spe specified change subject to this remaining consistent with the statistics of the the early universe and as well as changing densities which then lead to different formation histories of galaxies and so on we can also do things in fact i, I skipped over it uh, in the interests of time but we can also uh, do things like take entire patches of the early universe and kind of sort of cut and paste them so this is showing you here the the, the early universe um, where on the left hand side we've got one version of the early universe on the right hand side we've got a completely different early universe but we've kind of cut out this region and pasted it in there now it's not as simple as cut and paste because you have that statistical problem that i was just talking about but essentially this inner part is the same on both sides but the outer part is different and then you can start to see when you when you run these simulations what's the role of environment you can see that the kind of things going on inside here are similar but at some point, you know, the environment that this region sits in starts to have an impact on the way things are evolving inside the, the inner region. Um, so this, we can do things like that. Uh, we can change the angular momentum of a galaxy to see, you know, does, does that affect how diffuse the galaxy disk is, for example. So, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of things we can do. Um, and and uh, it's probably more things that we can do than we have time for, I suppose. Okay, I'd like to very briefly follow up on uh, your reply with two additional questions uh, before we go to a online participant who has raised their hand. Um, and it has to do with yeah the clear statement you made that there are certain transgressions you're not <laughs> willing to make. Right? There are certain conditions that need to be satisfied. You're you're not going to play with them. But so one specific question that came through is. Well, does this corrupt the initial power spectrum? And again, in sort of what is legitimate or what is not, and what might be worth investigating uh, yeah. and whatnot. Uh, another question was, well, can you make micro changes to the physics, so to speak, or maybe to subgrid models could it be an alternative shade of this? And so to what extent would it be uh, legit to play with recipes of gravity and uh, learn something? Uh, yeah about fundamental physics with such an approach yeah so so to go in order so so by construction the power spectrum is unchanged um now this is a this is a statistical statement of course because the power spectrum in, is 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 not precisely um uh it, it's, it's not precisely equal to its ensemble average in any finite region so it, that's a statistical question but in a statistical sense the power spectrum is unchanged and the way that we check you know have we transgressed is we can simply calculate the likelihood for the field so because the early universe in some sense is quite simple it's a gaussian random field um this is what what inflation tells us we have so we can calculate a likelihood for any given field and we can insert our modified fields to check whether the the likelihood has changed and you can think of this also in terms of a chi squared you know is is the chi squared still acceptable for this being a draw from that Gaussian uh, random uh, ensemble. Uh, so we do that. Um, and uh, it almost always is. I and mean, if you push things really hard, you know, if you, if you, so it's, you, you could in principle try and make a sort of step in density, for example, you might do something crazy, like say, I, I don't want this anymore to be a sort of continuous density. I want to have a, a big density ridge where it suddenly steps from being under dense to over dense in some tiny region. You could you you can certainly ask the algorithm to do that and and it will do it for you but then when you check the chi squared it'll be really large so it'll it'll try to make something maximally consistent and uh you know it's in in, in it's there, there is always the most consistent field you can always create a most consistent field with any given desiderata um because 
you know, nothing when you've got a Gaussian random field, in principle, anything can happen. It's just that some things are exponentially more likely than others. So um, we can construct crazy things, but we don't we choose not to construct crazy things and we check that we're not doing that uh, by, as I say, check, checking the, the likelihood of the field that we end up with. Um, as for the other part of the question, so yes, I mean, we very actively look into uh, how things like the subgrid physics affect the results that we get. So um, we, we uh, use different codes. So I've shown you results from Eagle, but we're actually using the TNG code at the moment as well. We use Ramses. We've used Changa in the past. And by comparing these different codes, we get a sense of if you use different subgrid assumptions, then how much difference does that make? And, you know, in this very, very loosely speaking, the answer is it often makes difference to the sort of normalization of trends, but normally the trends themselves tend to survive. So uh, this gives us some confidence that we'd, we'd, we we are you know doing something that can be untangled from those kinds of questions. Um, we haven't used this at all for modified gravity at present, but there's no reason why one couldn't. Um, one could certainly play around with these simulations with modified gravity in just the same way as you can you can do for uh, regular simulations. Thank you. And so we'll now go to a participant who has raised their hand, uh, Francisco Diego. Um, Vili, could you please let him speak by unmuting his microphone? Francisco, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, John, uh, um, Andrew, it's fantastic, fantastic explanation here. My question I always have was, is the association of galaxies with uh, with uh, globular clusters because when you form galaxies uh, you get this uh, kind of satellite globular cluster family of globular clusters that form is that any in any way uh, related to the formation of galaxies the merging and the globular clusters are the the, the byproduct of mergers or something like that is there any light in the in the origin of globular clusters please yeah, so it's, this is a topic we're very actively investigating, not with the simulations I've I've showed today, but with other genetically modified simulations uh, run with the Ramses code, where we focus on the formation of dwarf galaxies. The, the fundamental problem with globular clusters is relative to a whole galaxy, they're very small, um, and uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's very hard to resolve them in cosmological scale simulations. But we've progressed technologically to the point where we can just start to resolve the formation of star clusters in if, if we focus our attention on small galaxies. And indeed, the formation of star clusters within dwarf galaxies is an incredibly uh, pressing topic at the moment. The formation of nuclear star clusters in particular. So you could imagine if you if you form, if you regularly form nuclear star clusters inside dwarf galaxies which you later accrete onto the Milky Way, then uh, you could well imagine that uh, globular clusters are in some way related to uh, early formation of, of dwarf galaxies and so on. Um, and another thing that they may be related to is the formation of the supermassive black hole population as well, because at the moment we just have subgrid models for where you put supermassive black holes, but um, it may be that uh, you can kind of self-consistently resolve. If you resolve the formation of very dense star clusters in your galaxies, that these actually allow you, especially in the early universe, to uh, start forming supermassive black hole seeds as well. So you, you sort of um, it, it hit the nail on the head that this is a very important area, but it's only just coming into reach, really. Um, and it's something that we're uh, putting a lot of effort into it over the coming few years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for at least indirectly touching on two of the questions we no longer have time to answer, which were in the chat. I think you provided some hints as to what might be going on there as well. Um, yes, uh, we're at the end of today's seminar. Um, remains to thank you again for being with us today for slightly more than an hour. It was very interesting to, to hear about all this work and Looking ahead to uh, the next Game Changer seminar, which will be in January 
2024, uh, as we have no Christmas edition due to a collision of dates. Um, it will be on the 25th of January. So I hope you will join us again for that. And as always, you will hear from our EC newsletter uh, with sufficient lead time what the topic is going to be. So yeah, Andrew, have a very nice evening. Thanks again for joining us and hopefully see you soon. Thank you very much.